Okay, it's Dr. DeMaio. This is OT315 Lecture 2. You could say this would be part one because this is just the uh, axial skeleton and the skull. We still have to do the vertebrae. Okay, so let's go through it. So the skeleton total has 206 bones. Uh, axial skeleton has 80 bones. The appendicular skeleton has 126 bones. And um, there are different types of bones. Uh, you see some types of bones here. We see flat bones in the skull. And there are some irregular bones, irregular shaped bones. So we're probably not going to see too many other bo types of bones in this slide. But remember, we have long bones, flat bones, irregular shaped bones. We have uh, um, sesamoid bones. And we do see another type of bone in this slide called a wormium bone, which is kind of weird. And we'll go through that as we go through each slide. We'll go through the different types of bones. And if you still need me to summarize them, I will summarize them on another slide. Surface markings, we're always going to be looking at the surface markings and including the foramen. So I didn't write foramen here. We have foramen, meatus, fossas. You know, a fossa is a small space that something could sit in. Um, sometimes a fossa could be large, foramens could be large, foramens could be small, they can have different shapes. We name them according to the shape sometimes, like a rotundum is round, a lacerum is like a laceration, like a jagged cut, an oval is oval shaped. Sometimes a foramen is named according to where it's located, like the stylomastoid foramen between the styloid process of the temporal bone and the mastoid process. So. We have gone through some of this stuff in the lab. We're going to be going through it again in a little more detail here in the lecture. So axial skeleton, as you can see on the left side, we're talking about the axial skeleton, but on the right, it's talking about the appendicular. And the axial skeleton has 80 bones. And the appendicular skeleton has 126 bones. And um, the axial skeleton is right down the center axis of the body. And so the arms and legs are not part of the axial skeleton, obviously. Neither are the girdles. There's a pectoral girdle, and then there's a pelvic girdle. Okay? And then you have, off the pectoral girdles, you have the upper extremities. That's for the appendicular skeleton. We'll talk more about those girdles and the uh, extremities later. But right now, let's focus our conversation on the axial skeleton. And there's 80 bones. There's a skull, which has cranial bones and facial bones. And there's eight cranial bones and 14 facial bones. And then you have the um, associated bones of the inner ear, which we didn't talk about in this lecture too much. There's three in each ear. Uh, maybe we could talk about that another time. Those are called the auditory ossicles, six total, three in each area, ear, excuse me. And other associated bones, such as the hyoid bone, which is not connected to the spine. It's in the front. It helps to form a connection to the muscles of swallowing, <clears throat> protecting the trachea as well. And then the thoracic cage is a whole nother ball game where we have ribs, including, and, and then the ribs come around to the sternum in the center. And there's one sternum with three parts, which we'll go over on another uh, lecture. And um, you have the spine, 24 movable bones. And vertebrae are 24 vertebrae. But then there's a sacrum, which was actually fused five vertebrae. And a coccyx, which is fused four vertebrae. So we'll talk about them on another um, lecture. So today we're talking about the axial skeleton. Don't get nervous for this picture. Okay, so we just, I loaded a whole bunch of stuff on this one slide just to get as much as I can in there. Remember the cranium has a frontal bone, two parietal bones, two temporal bones, an occipital bone, an ethmoid bone, and the keystone, the sphenoid bone. This is part of the cranium. Remember the skull is broken up into the cranium and the facial bones, 14 facial bones. And you know, on this case, we have two inferior turbinal bones, two lacrimal bones, a one mandible, two maxillae that fuse, two nasal bones, a palatine bone, two palatine bones, excuse me, a vomer, and two zygomatic bones. So the skull 
the body's most complex bony structure. It's formed by the cranium and the facial bones. The cranium protects the brain like a helmet, and it's the site of the attachment for the head and neck. You know, if you have a head injury, guess what? You can have a neck injury. If you have a neck injury, you could have a head injury. They're connected. You can't separate those two. Well, connected meaning by a joint or an articulation between the skull and the top vertebrae called the atlas. The facial bones are um, supply a framework for the face and sense organs and the teeth. They provide openings for the passage of air and food, and they anchor the facial muscles of expression. The anatomy of the cranium is eight cranial bones, two parietal bones, two temporal bones, one frontal, one occipital, one sphenoid, and an ethmoid. I know I said it already, but it's good to do repeating it. Cranial bones are thin and remarkably strong, like an egg, shaped like an egg, yet it has strength because of the shape, the curvy linear shape. The frontal bone forms the anterior portion of the cranium. It articulates or connects to posteriorly with the parietal bones via the coronal suture. The major markings of the frontal bone include the supraorbital margins, the anterior cranial fossa, and the frontal sinuses, internal and lateral to the glabella. Here's the frontal bone. And the glabella is this protruding portion here. And the frontal nasal suture, um, you can see a little tiny suture here between the frontal and the nasal bones. And then there's a supraorbital foramen and a supraorbital margin. This glabella becomes important if you're talking about acromegaly. I don't know if you've ever heard of acromegaly. Acromegaly is the disease of uh, gigantism. And that is one of the metabolic diseases that can occur in, your, in bone growth. Children who have too much or increased amounts of growth hormone during the growth stages will grow really tall. And as that growth hormone continues to be produced after those bones fuse, because your bones eventually fuse, they actually could get this, call, this thing called acromegaly, which one of the signs of acromegaly is frontal embossing, where this gets very thickened. This glabella gets very thickened. Kind of looks like Cro-Magnon Man. If you've ever seen Andre the Giant, the wrestler, you see he has that very thick forehead across his forehead. Uh, and that's the glabella, enlargement and thickening of the glabella. It's actually not just a thickening of the bone, it's a thickening of the connective tissue below. It actually could be like a half inch to an inch thick. And if you touch your forehead right by between your eyes, you know you do not have a half inch of soft tissue there. You know, you may even have an eighth of an inch of soft tissue. So the story goes in the Old Testament in the Bible when Goliath throws a stone and it says that it embedded into the giant's forehead. How could it embed into anyone's forehead? It didn't kill him. That's not what killed that giant, that stone, but the stone embedded into his forehead. That's what it, that's the actual documentation. And then he fell down and then David cut his head off. So um, frontal embossing is a sign of gi giantism. And that's probably what that giant had. It was documentation of his actual, uh, the weight of his spear, the weight of his spearhead, his armor, his helmet, and the sword, and so on and so forth. And it had to be a very large man. And it said that he was three cubits tall, which I think is like nine feet. And so the fact that he threw a stone and it embedded it to his forehead further substantiates the possibility that this is a true story about a true giant, so to speak, who had acromegaly because of frontal embossing of the glabella. Parietal bones form most of the superior and lateral aspects of the skull. So here's the parietal bones, right? It's articulating with the frontal bone with the coronal suture. It's articulating the temporal bone with the temporal uh, squamous suture. And it articulates with the occipital bone with the lambdoid suture. And then there's a sagittal suture between both parietal bones. A suture is a joint. It's a very tight joint. It's a sutural joint. 
Four sutures mark the articulations of the parietal bones, like I just said, coronal suture, sagittal suture, lambdoid suture, and squamous suture. And I just explained that all to you. I don't need to go over that again. That would be redundant. Now, this is looking at a person from the back, and we did this in the lab, and you can see this um, protrusion here called the external occipital protuberance. Bingo, right there, right? And it's a thickening of the bone. Does anybody remember what that attachment was for? That was attachment for what? Okay, I want you to try to remember and write it down what the attachment, what, it, what attaches there, okay? And uh, what kind of thing happens when you go to the medical doctor? And we'll talk about this in a class. We'll follow up. If you want to remind me in class after you watch the video today that you would uh, ask me about this. What attaches here and what, what role does that play in certain diseases? Okay, so we have other major markings. You have the lambdoid suture coming around here all the way around. You have the sagittal suture coming down the center. And then you can see a little bit of the occipital mastoid suture between the mastoid process and the occipital bone right over here. Underneath, you can see a little bit of the occipital condyles, which are going to sit right on top of the atlas vertebrae. Trying to draw it. I'm not doing a great job, am I? <laughs> and so that's the occipital condyles. Very important clinically, the occipital condyles provide um, information to anything that's coming close to the brain stem right here because the brain is exiting the foramen magnum here in between those two condyles. The atlas is sitting on top of that. These condyles have the highest concentration of some type of nerves. Does anybody remember the type of nerves? What is the highest concentration of what type of nerves are on those occipital condyles? We'll talk about that. Make sure you ask me that question too. Okay, so um, we have the superior nuchal line. Okay, and here's your mastoid processes. We practiced in the lab how to feel the mastoid process and the occipital external occipital platoons. Another way of saying this is E O. P for the external occipital protuberance, and then the mastoid process is separate. Okay. All right. So the temporal bones form the inferior lateral aspects of the skull and parts of the cranial floor. They're divided into four major regions. There's a squamous portion, the tympanic portion, the mastoid, and the petrous portion of the temporal bones. The major markings of the temporal bone include the zygomatic, the styloid and the mastoid processes, and also the mandibular and middle cranial fossa. The mandibular process fits into the mandibular fossa. So also you want to know the mandibular fossa. Very important. That's a site for a specific joint. Remember the name of the joint where the temporal bone meets the, um, I'm sorry, yeah, the mandibula, mandibular bone meets the temporal bone. It's called the temporal mandibular joint. Major openings of the temporal bone would be the stylomastoid, the jugular foramen, the stylomastoid foramen, external and internal auditory meatus, and even the carotid canal is running through there. So here's a lateral view of the temporal bone. You're looking at it from this view. So this is anterior over here, and this is posterior back here, right? And we're looking at it from the lateral view from the right. And so you can see the squamous suture would be coming around this way. You have the external acoustic or auditory meatus, the hole for the inner ear, right, to enter the ear. You have a tympanic region around that area. It's called a tympanic region. Here's that mandibular fossa, and that's going to receive the mandibular condyles or processes of the mandible. mandible. It's going to fit right in there, forming the TMJ joint. Here's your mastoid process and the mastoid region. Here's your styloid process coming down. Here's your mandible. And that styloid mastoid frame, you can't see it, but it's underneath a tiny little hole. And a nerve is going to be coming out here. The nerve comes out between there and goes into the face to supply the muscles of the face. 
okay and of course there's going to be nerves deep in there for the ear in a ear now we have this process coming out this is called the temporal process or a better way of saying it is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone the zygomatic process of the temporal bone it's going to meet the zygomatic bone at the temporal process of the zygomatic bone right here and it's going to form the bucket handle otherwise known as the zygomatic arch the sphenoid bone uh, is a butterfly shaped bone it's kind of a strange looking bone it spans the width of the entire cranial fossa it forms a central wedge that articulates with all other cranial bones hence they call it sometime the keystone of the cranium it consists of a central body a greater wing greater wings lesser wings and the pterygoid processes which are important for muscles of the TMJ here's those pterygoid processes coming down uh, they don't mark it too well do they hmm. Are they marking it this would be a pterygoid process and coming down would be another pterygoid process so the major markings of the cell of the uh, sphena bone are the cella tersica which means you can't really see because this is a superior view can't see those pterygoid processes too well but you're looking from the top down and you can see this entire structure is called the cella tersica in the center is the hypophyseal fossa of the cellotrusca where you would sit if you would sit inside that saddle and what sits inside the hypophyseal fossa the hypophyseal gland otherwise known as the pituitary gland okay you also have your optic canals and they're kind of going on an angle this way so if you bring a stick to the lab you can stick a stick through there a little tiny stick or a pipe cleaner would go on an angle like that as a matter of fact when I do a test I put the stick in there with a flag I said name the canal and the nerve that passes through there and of course you know that's the that's the optic canal so it's got to be the optic nerve right you have a couple other frame in here let me just erase what I did here so it's not too confusing um, you have this frame and oval and it's notice it's oval shaped that receives part of cranial nerve 5 the trigeminal nerve and are they showing you that you can't see the other foramen up here the foramen rotundum from this view but if you look underneath it would be inside going forward so the major openings like I said are the foramen rotundum oh there it is you can see it right there there is the foramen rotundum right there you can see a little portion of it the foramen oval there's a frame spinosum which I never ask on a test question and then you have the optic canals and then you can see the superior orbital fissure so when you see this frame and rotundum let me just show you this in this next view so here's the view from we're looking at it from uh, I think this is from the front right so here's the pterygoid processes coming down and here's your frame and rotundum and notice this is the superior orbital fissure if you were looking into the eye from the other angle you're looking into the orbit of the eye you would see a superior orbital fissure and then an inferior orbital fissure which you can't see from this angle we're looking from behind the eyes right inside you see the frame and rotundum it's hard to make out here but if you were tilting the skull you would see a nice circular foramen and then that is going to pass through the cranial nerve 5 a portion of will pass through and go through the inferior orbital frame so there's a super uh, fissure there's a superior orbital fissure that's formed within the sphenoid bone but the inferior orbital fissure is formed by several other bones too let's look at that here you go so here we see this is the optic canal right here right optic canal and this right here this is the superior orbital fissure it's not marked so that is your superior orbital fissure okay and then this is your inferior orbital fissure okay and as we're looking at this this is the 
perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone coming up. And then this is the superior nasal concha of the ethmoid bone. This is the inferior nasal concha. This is the mental foramen. Okay. And this is the superior orbital foramen. So I just figured I'd fill that in the blanks for you. And then we have a bone that's very deep. Um, it's the most deep of all the skull bones. It lies between the sphenoid and the nasal bones. It forms most of the bony area between the nasal cavity and the orbits. Its major markings include the cribriform plate, the cristigali. Now, within the cribriform plate are tiny holes. If you remember from lab, what are the names of those holes? The olfactory foramina, right? They're within the cribriform plate. And those are the, the framing for cranial nerve number one for olfaction, right? The crystal gala sticks up like a dorsal fin, and that helps to attach the meninges. It's an attachment for the meninges of the brain. Perpendicular plate comes down and helps to form the nasal septum, the bony nasal septum. And then the nasal concha help as turbinates to allow air to turbinate and circle around inside your nose as it comes in. And then within the bone itself, it has sinuses. A sinus is a cavern within a bone. It has its purpose. And one of its purposes is to help um, resonate sound when you talk and also helps the drainage of the brain. The brain is gonna drain into that sometimes and it can capture some of the excess fluids. So here's that ethmoid bone. Here's the Christagala at the top. You're looking at this from a frontal view here. And so it's hard to see the cribriform plate would be on top. You'd have to be looking down from straight down to see the, the cribriform plate and the olfactory foramina. And here's the perpendicular plate coming down. Okay. Now we have this thing called wormian bones that are found within sutures. Another name for a wormian bone is a sutural bone. So they're tiny, irregularly shaped bones that appear within sutures. You can see one right here. So this is the sagittal suture. And all of a sudden you see this big bone within there separated. Facial bones. There are 14 bones of which only the mandible and the vomer are unpaired. The paired bones are the maxilla, the zygomatic bones, the nasal bones, the lacrimal bones, the palatine bones, and the inferior concha. So let's look at the mandible and its markings. The mandible is the lower jaw bone. It's the largest, strongest bone of the face. The mandible is the largest, strongest bone of the face. Its major markings include the coronoid processes. These are the coronoid processes right here. And the mandibular condyles here, which form the temporal mandibular joint. Of course, you're going to have alveoli, the sockets for the teeth, and the mandibular and mental foramen. Okay. Sometimes they call this the body, and this is the angle. I don't bother asking that, and the ramus of it. Most important, I think, for us uh, clinically is the mandibular condyle. And these are also attachments for muscles as well, the coronoid processes. The maxillary bones are actually fused bones that make up the upper jaw and the central portion of the facial skeleton. The facial keystone bones that articulate with all the other facial bones except the mandible. They're marked, you now when they say except the mandible, you got to realize the teeth are articulating with the lower teeth, the upper teeth, right? Their major markings include the palatine, frontal, and zygomatic processes, the alveolar margins, the inferior orbital fissure, and the maxillary sinuses. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Here's the zygomatic bones, the cheekbones, right? And they're irregular shaped bones that form the prominences of the cheeks and the inferior lateral margins of the orbits. So it helps to form the orbit inside the eye too and helps to form the zygomatic arch 
otherwise known as the bucket handle. The most commonly fractured site of the face is right there. So this is the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. This is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. Together they form this zygomatic arch or bucket handle and where they fuse together as a joint basically an immovable joint it's almost like it's scored and ready to be broken here's the nasal bones okay nasal bones are two tiny bones and they help to form the bridge of the nose this would be the glabella here right and there's the nasal bone the lacrimal bones they contribute to the medial wall of the uh, orbit and they contain a deep groove called the lacrimal fossa you know what lacrimal means tears and within there there is a tear duct that's the lacrimal fossa and the, and the tears would come through that the palatine bones are two bony plates that form portions of the hard palate and it's actually notice it's the posterior portion of the hard palate here this is the vomer meeting the vomer and this is the occipital bone right here part of the occipital bone but also it helps to form the walls inside of the nasal cavity you can't see it it sticks straight up into the nasal cavity so the vomer is the other bone that's a plow shaped bone forms part of the nasal septum and that's that one we just pointed to before coming up and then it meets this is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid and this is the vomer in green okay so here's a view from an inferior view of the skull you can see the occipital bone here right there's a little bit of the parietal bone here you can see this is the temporal bone in orange here's the zygomatic bone in pink there's that vomer in green and here's the palatine bone now the maxilla, the anterior hard palate is part of the maxillar bone. And they call that the palatine process as it meets the palatine bone. You can see this right here. These are the occipital condyles. Occipital condyles are very important because they have the highest concentration of mechanoreceptors to determine position and space around the most vital area i would say where the brain is coming through this here not only the brain comes through blood supply of the vertebral arteries are coming through here and your csf has to come through here so the atlas is sitting right underneath here like a ring i'm going to exaggerate it and it has a hole in it too if the atlas slid this way or rotated up on an angle this way whatever these joints can detect that movement because they have the highest concentration of mechanoreceptors. A mechanoreceptor is detecting movement, right? So on the surface, that has the highest concentration of mechanoreceptors that give information for position in space known as proprioception. Sometimes people use those terms interchangeably, proprioceptors and mechanoreceptors. But the term proprioception is a catch-all term for your ability to feel where you are in space without vision. So it's not just joint nerves. It could be on muscles and tendons and even your skin, believe it or not. But uh, it has the highest concentration because the brain has to come through there and the blood supply to the brain could be occluded by a problem in that area. And then you have other things that are really important, like here's the temporal mandibular uh, joint where the mandible comes into the mandibular fossa that has the highest concentration of nociceptors and that's for pain the most pain sensitive joint in the body so if you have if you saw the atlas sitting here like this and then you see this is the styloid process coming down here's the mandibular fossa you have a facial nerve coming out of here there's a lot of stuff going on in this area it's a very very sensitive area and I always joke around in the lab with my students and I say you know being a former marine and uh, trying to get a good shot with your m16 that's a perfect kill shot right through the ear by the way around I, I know it's a terrible thing to think about <laughs> 
but if it's going to save someone's life of the innocent people, it's it's something that needs to be done. Um, but if you have a, um, a problem in that ear, that area, it can cause a lot of havoc in facial nerves and your cranial nerves, your brain, your blood flow, everything can be infected there. So this view here is the nasal concha, the inferior nasal concha, which is separate from the ethmoid bone. So there are paired curved bones in the nasal cavity that form part of the lateral walls of the nasal cavity. And they act as turbinates to allow air to turbinate in there. So here's, this is where they would be. See, inferior nasal concha would be right here. Here's your vomer meeting the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid. And these are the superior nasal concha of the ethmoid. Here's your nasal bones, right? Here's your, um, this is your zygomatic bone forming part of the orbit of the eye. And there's your sphenoid in pink forming part of the orbit of the eye. Here's the maxillae forming part of the orbit of the eye. And there is the um, lacrimal bones forming part of the orbit of the eye. And even the ethmoid bone helps to form a part of the orbit of the eye. It's actually a very good challenge for yourself to practice looking at just the eye. In your book, you have just a picture of this and naming all those different components. We have a superior orbital foramen, and we saw, talked about the nerves that come out there in the lab. We have a ophthalmic branch of the cranial nerve 5. So if you just said cranial 5, that's fine. We have cranial nerve 5 coming through the superior orbital fissure, a cranial nerve coming through the inferior orbital fissure, all part of cranial nerve 5. And you even have cranial part of cranial nerve 5 coming through the um, uh, inferior orbital foramen here. And then you even have a cranial nerve coming through the mental foramen here. Remember, cranial nerve 5 has three branches. One is going to supply up here in this area here of the face. The other is going to supply this area of the face. And the other one supplies this area of the face. So the sensory to the face is from cranial nerve 5, V1, V2, and V3, ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular branch. And it also, besides sensory to the face, cranial nerve number five, the trigeminal nerve, is motor to the face. Okay, so what else we got here? Let me erase all this stuff so we don't get too confused here. All right. Anything else we need to know here? Oh, you have the optic canal coming through here too. You know, that's for cranial nerve two. And it's hard to see it. This is kind of dark. Okay. Here's a lateral view of the skull, and you can see the mental frame in here again. Um, here's the maxilla in purple and zygomatic bone in blue. And you can see all name all the bones like I taught you in the lab. Name the bones first. Here's your styloid process right here. And here's a mastoid process. Now you can't see the foramen from the lateral view, only from the inferior view. But the cranial nerve seven for the facial nerve is coming out and supplying the muscles of facial expression. And also it supplies taste to a portion of the tongue. Right. And you can see all your sutures here. I don't need to go over those again. And the EAM. Okay. Looking at it from the posterior view, again, we see this uh, lambdoid suture going all the way around the occipital bone. This is the parietal bones up here. Here's the occipital bone, right? And this is, this is the lambdoid sutures coming around. There's your sagittal sutures between two parietal bones. You can see a portion of the squamous suture of the temporal bone, but then we have this uh, I guess you could say occipital mastoid suture between the two of these. Here's your mastoid process. You can see a little bit of the occipital condyles, not seeing the bottom of it, but just seeing the back of it. Here's your EOP again, right? Okay. You can see a little bit of the vomer there from the back. There's your vomer right there. And a little bit of the hard palate. So you can see a portion of the hard palate there. This, so this is part of the maxillary called the palatine process. 
and um, that's part of the heart palette as well. Lateral view again. Let's see what we have here. Anything I missed? You can see everything pretty clearly on this one. Now, here's a mid sagittal view of the skull, and it's a cut down the middle so you can see inside the cranium and inside the face. And you notice that the frontal sinus, that's part of the frontal bone, there's actually a cavern for, for a sinus there. And then you have a sphenoid sinus. And I don't think they show the ethmoid sinuses in here. They don't show it, but there is an ethmoid sinus as well. And there is a maxillary sinus, which they're not showing on this. So you have sinuses behind your maxillary bone, in, within your maxillary bones, like right alongside your nose. And they're not showing it here. Okay, this is just the same view I gave you guys in the lab. Remember that this one right here is a typo. That should be cranial nerve seven with V11, not V1, right? So that should be cranial nerve seven. That's cranial nerve seven. Whoop, come on, draw, will you? So the facial nerve is cranial nerve seven, just to let you know that, okay? So you can practice your frame in here again, you know, for your lab using this as well. And this is a superior to inferior. That was an inferior view, right? Or where were we? Uh, I forget where we just were. But this is a superior to inferior view. And now this is a good one. You could split this in half and just memorize one half of it. It will help you just to practice over and over again if you had to draw it. But this is all yellow is the frontal bone, right? And the one in the middle between there, this is the ethmoid bone coming up with its cribriform plate. Christogala coming straight up and it's olfactory foramen. Don't forget the olfactory foramen that are in there. Here's the sphenoid bone with the cella tersica. And within the cella tersica, you have the hypophyseal fossa or pituitary fossa. Now, as you look to the sides here, you see right alongside on either side here are the foramen lacerum and that's for the carotid artery to come up and then you remember you have uh, the carotid canal you're really looking at the roof of the canal here you have to see the entrance underneath coming in laterally and then it pops the carotid artery pops up through the foramen lacerum you can see all your different foramen here that we went over, foramen rotundum, foramen oval, uh, optic canal, uh, what else? And we have the jugular foramen right here, cranial nerves 9, 10, and 11, plus the jugular vein passing through there, hypoglossal canal, the hypoglossal nerve, and internal acoustic meatus. Which one are they showing you? Uh, that would be like right there. Yep. This one right here is the internal acoustic meatus. And that's for cranial nerves. Actually, cranial nerve 7 enters with cranial nerve 8. Remember, we said 7 took a shortcut. Went through here and then it dropped down between the stylomastoid foramen. 